start with a little review from what we've been talking about for the past uh, a couple um, uh, lessons. Uh, we, we, we switched the focus. We were talking about a lot of different things from Bible study to cults to, you know, uh, uh, witnessing to all these different things. And now we're just kind of coming back to this idea of uh, discipleship. And so over the past two weeks we've been looking at, at discipleship and what makes a disciple and whatnot. Uh, those lessons are online if you need to review or anything like that. But just a few things. Christianity and, Christianity and discipleship are united. It's kind of one and the same. It's not, you know, there's some Christians and there's some disciples. It's to, to be a Christian, you are a disciple of Christ, you know. Um, not to say, I'm not saying that you're perfect or whatever, but um, a Christianity at the core is being, I mean, a Christian at its core is being a disciple of Christ because you're not, you're not, a religion isn't going to save you, you know what I mean? It's about Christ, and Christ is the only way to, sal to salvation, which means you are Christ's disciple, you know what I mean? It's more than just saying I'm a Christian. It's about actually being Christ's disciple, you know. Um, discipleship is living like Christ. That's, that's you know what it's all about. Discipleship is abandoning the lust of the flesh. It's no longer about you know my will first. It's about what God wants and God's will. Um, and then we we brought up the three ethical themes that we're gonna we're gonna be looking at those later. I just wanted to introduce them so don't you know you haven't missed anything. Uh, money, sex, and power. Uh, just those three th kind of things that go hand in hand are essentially uh, tied in together. Um, and so then that takes us to the question of the week from last week, which was the idea of how do you balance mercy with justice? So of those of you guys who were here last week, did you guys were you, were you guys able to, to brainstorm on that? Did you take the thing out? Because it's going to oversteep. Yeah, I had a question about, it says how do you balance mercy with justice? Mercy. The word mercy, when I think of that, is to not harm, uh -huh. and justice is to something like, something like revenge. Uh -huh. It's like, do you, how do you do, is that, is that the question right Yeah, there? yeah, how do you balance mercy with justice? I have, well, I, my thoughts are thinking of, usually you're bad for good. Good way, but I want to say mysterious. Uh huh. Yeah, that's something I thought of just now. Okay. Anybody else have any thoughts? I think you need to have forgiveness for whoever you're um, showing justice towards. Okay. Because without forgiveness, it's really hard to show mercy. Okay. Right yeah. So. Can you give us like an example, just to kind of elaborate what you mean? Um, okay, so say you're a judge, and uh, um, you previously, um, you had a daughter, and she previously was um, raped and killed. Well, now you're a judge, and the person that's up for conviction, he raped someone else's daughter. Okay. Well, if you don't have forgiveness in your heart, it's going to be really hard to show that person mercy and um, give them fair justice. So, um, okay, good point, but let me let me follow that up with a question. Um, are they deserving of mercy, or is their sin worthy of punishment? Mm. What do you think of that? As Christians, we should still show mercy. Okay. Um, to show God's love, and um, but they still deserve justice because you can't just get away with any crime okay. or any any sin. <coughs> um. So to start, I'm not saying like I don't I don't know the end result, but to start it off, I think you really need to have forgiveness towards that person to have love towards them. Okay. Zach, what do you think? You stand off and quiet. What do you think? I was going to say what uh, Gracie said, but just going to have forgiveness. Uh, and kind of look into your own heart and see how, if you were on the other end of the... Okay, so 
Wait, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it, you know, where, see if you, you know, look at it in a different perspective before you pass just, uh, judgment. Okay. So, let's say, let, let's take, let's take an actual person from history, so this kind of gives it a little bit more uh -huh. difficulty. <laughs> um, okay, so does everybody know who Ted Bundy is? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you don't, uh, he raped all kinds of women and uh, killed all kinds of women. Killed and raped all kinds of women. Yeah. So uh, okay. So he was um, unrepentant to death. Actually, he one of the last things he said was, "I learned that there is no right and wrong. There's just what somebody else's preference is." Mm -hmm. And so I'm being killed because somebody else thought it was wrong for me to do this thing. So let's take the case of Ted Bundy. How do you balance with mercy with justice when you're dealing with people who aren't repentant? Well, he went through the justice system. Uh -huh. But I'm talking about your attitude as a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> let's say it was your daughter, or, yeah, let's say you have a daughter and, and, and she well, was killed by Well, I would have to forgive Ted Bundy. I, I would, technically, I would have to forgive Ted Bundy. But can you forgive someone and still desire their punishment? Well, yeah. I mean, he still, that was that was his due punishment. It doesn't mean I have to live with unforgiveness and bitterness in my heart for what he did. But he still, and that punishment was out of my hands. So is it okay for me to be okay seeing him receive that punishment? Well, I think so, as long as I don't have bitterness and unforgiveness in my heart that's weighing me down. Okay. It's like if we... Okay, so when, when before we get saved, we live in sin and, you know, we pretty much do whatever we want. And a lot of times, the consequences, so then we get saved, but we still <coughs> have to face the consequences of what we did before we got saved. God still expects us, sometimes, we still have to go through the consequences of what we did before got we got saved, mm -hmm. you know? I may still be paying for mis I'm saved now, but I may still be paying for mistakes. Could God cause, them cause them to not? Okay, you're saved now, so I'm gonna wipe the slate clean, and you don't have to pay the consequences for these sins. God doesn't do that. Sometimes we still have to pay the consequences of our sins, even though we are saved now. That changes our heart, and I think when we have a situation like this. We have to have, allow God to change our hearts. Even though I may believe that justice was still served, if that's what happened, if, if he went through the justice system and was handed down the death sentence, whether I prayed for that or not, I have to know that God allowed that to happen for a reason. So let me stop you there. Nicole, what do you think separates that justice that Serena's talking about from revenge like Isaiah brought up? I would think revenge would be more of taking somebody, in, in the Ted Bundy case, maybe, even. Taking maybe, if he had a sister or something, and doing the same thing to them. For okay. somebody that he loved. Would be more revenge. Okay. Rather than justice. So justice is more focused on... What is right and what is wrong. Okay. So because he did the crime, he is worthy of the punishment. Right. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so... In a more personal aspect, Chuck, how, how, how do you think you, um, the, the, the two fit together as far as mercy and, just, and uh, justice? In a more natural, like, perspective, like, uh, how it applies to us as Christians. Like, for instance, someone wronged you um, in a church setting kind of thing. Balancing that, treating them with mercy versus justice. I mean, there, there will be a consequence for what they did for that. Um, you, you need to forgive them. Um, and one thing, despite the consequence for that, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, like, go telling everybody what they did. You shouldn't, you know, slander them. Um, 
if if you've really forgiven them and they've they've been punished or whatever, you know, um, you should just that should be the end of it. Okay. Let me tell you guys a story. There was a pastor I knew who um, one of his uh, one of his associate pastors were giving him a lot of problems. And he was just a real patient kind of guy. So he kept forgiving the associate pastor. Do you think what he did was right or what he did was wrong? What was the guy's name? Oh, I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> uh, but that... The idea is he was showing mercy to his associate pastor, but at the same time, it never resolved. Didn't the associate pastor need justice? Correction. Uh-huh. Correction. Like, yeah. what, what are these two people doing to each other? Um, I can't give specifics, but let's say um, the associate pastor was rude and talked about him behind his back. Yeah. So what do you think? And the question was, that's why I was asking, like, I kind of wandered off a little bit and then... Oh, I see. I trying to focus on what you were saying. I see. Uh, if if there's an so, uh, there was a senior pastor, the, the head pastor, right, and uh, he had an associate pastor who was having problems with, and so he kept forgiving him and showing him mercy. But at the same time, was that right or wrong for him to have done that because... Yes, he was showing mercy, but then the problem was still there, and it was a continual thing. So. So they, those two guys were. Uh, it was hard to be near each other. Right. Every day that they went to church. Right. Right. Okay. So I mean, at one hand, the pastor was being a merciful person, but on the other hand, you know, this associate pastor was causing a lot of problems for the senior pastor. So I mean, was he right or wrong? You see that it was unhealthy. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're going to look at is a two perspective kind of thing, and let's start off with Micah six eight. Um, if you would like a Bible Isaiah, we've got some over here, or I'll just read it out loud so you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I can do that for now. Okay. Uh, Micah six eight. Turning past it. These little little books here, you you flip just like that, and you're past all of them. Okay. Micah six eight says this: He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Okay. So. From this, there's a few different things that we can that we can learn. Um, the first is God expects us to do what's right. Okay, in the case of that of that senior pastor with the associate pastor, for instance, yes, there should have been some form of correction. See you know what I mean? Now, once again, though, sometimes if you handle things with patience rather than rushing to get, to 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 do something, it works out a lot better. You know what I mean? Like, I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a kid, and they do something, I don't care, uh, they lie to you, whatever. And you instantly start yelling at them, spank them on their butt, ground them for a week or two, and send them to their room, and you're just sitting there, you're steaming in the... Versus if you just send them to their room for a minute, cool off, and then make a decision. You know what I mean? Yeah. You I, never know what you and I would have done at that moment. Yeah, Exactly. Exactly. And so there's that idea that we are called to do what's right, but don't be rash in decision making. Um, second, uh, don't uh, kind of with this. Don't be moved to inaction. Sometimes people think that waiting on God is being moved to inaction. There's a difference between waiting and waiting on God. Waiting is where you're just unmotivated and you don't seek after your God. You just kind of sit there and do nothing. Waiting on God is when you postpone what you're doing. You just step away from it for a minute. And you seek God until he answers. This may take years, it may take months, it may take days, it may take hours. Don't really know. See what I mean? There's a difference between just waiting versus waiting on God. So uh, when I say don't be moved to an action, I'm not talking about waiting on God. Because sometimes 
what ended up happening with that pastor is after a few years of his, of his patients, the senior pastor's patients, eventually he brought, uh, he brought um, I can't think of the word, correction to the associate pastor over time, not all at once, just over the period of time, to where eventually the associate pastor was no longer the associate pastor. Um, and eventually uh, the associate pastor stopped doing what he was doing, but it took some time. It took the years of the pastor's patience and, and forgiveness, then it took the years after that of the correction, and it took the years after that of him being out of the position of power. See what I mean? Um, and so sometimes things things take a while. So don't be moved to an action, but wait on the Lord. Yeah. Be patient in decisions. I already mentioned this before um, with the doing what's right. Do what's right, but you know, be patient in your decisions. Don't be rash in your decision making. Don't don't make a decision based off of anger, hunger, etc. <laughs> <clears throat> but then there's the idea of enjoy being merciful. Enjoy being merciful. How many of you guys have known a Christian who was just, it seemed like they couldn't wait to tell somebody they were going to hell? You know what I mean? They're just like, God's going to cut you down. You know what I mean? And they just couldn't wait to get it out there. I see them on, on Facebook all the time, you know. Hey, if you do this, you're going to hell. Yeah. You know what I mean? We've all known those kinds of Christians. Um, Enjoy being merciful, because God does. You know what I mean? We have, um, in the Bible, we have God being patient with the children of Israel, even though they were in sin, all the way from the wilderness and then the 1400s B.C., all the way down to the exile from Judah in 586 B.C. That's like almost a thousand years of, uh, before God brought, brought them to exile. That's a long time. See what I mean? Um, so, anyways, enjoy being merciful. Don't be don't don't do that thing where you're like, oh, I'm I'm holding off, but I know what I'm thinking in my heart isn't good. Well, that's not good. <laughs> you read all this about from India. Is this a, just like something to write down? Um, if you look on your sheet, it says at the top. Hold on. Oh, okay, there we go. And it says at the top, uh, today we prayed for, that's where India would go. Um, and then how do you balance mercy with justice? This is just notes. If you want to take notes, you can. Um, oh, so this is what I should be writing? Um, for that question, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so there's three things with this passage that we should notice. I'll read it again to you. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what the, when what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. So there's three things he says. The first is justice. The second is kindness, also mercy. It's kind of the same kind of idea. I really can't get into it right now, but uh, you'd have to go into like a study of the Hebrew word, and I really don't want to do that. Um, and then the third, third thing is, is walk humbly with God or glorify God. So <coughs> you really have these three kind of themes, and it kind of goes like this. Your action justice do the right thing but then you have the attitude that you should have while you're doing the right thing mercy when someone is repentant you should be quick to forgive them you should be quick to reconcile with them you know what I mean but then there's the third thing walk humbly with your God this is more your purpose if your focus is on being merciful just to be merciful then you really have no far far-reaching goal in life. You never really have no purpose-driven life. You know what I mean? But if your purpose in your life decisions is to glorify God, walk humbly with your God, well then the reason why you're going to act with justice and the reason why you're going to have an attitude of mercy is going to be tempered with your life purpose, which is to glorify God. Because our life purpose is to glorify God, because we are called to walk humbly with God, Therefore, we're going to act with justice, and we're going to have a heart of mercy or kindness. Okay? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So it all kinds of e evens out. Um, God has called us to do the right thing, but we don't have to enjoy the judgment that comes on somebody else. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 12. Uh, verses 20 through 21. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
So he has this, this thing, do good for this person, and then they'll receive punishment. Kind of seems like a conundrum. And that's exactly it. If you desire for bad things to come on your enemy, it won't come on your enemy. But if you don't desire for bad things to come on your enemy and you're serving them out of love, then God will bring them to repentance through the process of judgment. <laughs> See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the only way to get your to get those people that you hate to get what they deserve is to not want them to get what they deserve. Yeah. See what I mean? It's kind of one of those conundrums. <laughs> but then he, he finishes all this up with, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's kind of it's, that's important to remember whenever we're talking about mercy and, ju and justice. Overcome evil with good, um, and this is something I'm going to bring up later. But remember, some, one person not getting justice results in other people being wronged. Like for instance, in the case of Ted Bundy, if they hadn't brought that man to justice, first off, all those women who died, there there would be no justice for the death uh -oh. death that he caused. Second off, um, other people's lives would be placed into harm because Ted Bundy wasn't dealt with. And it's the same thing in a church situation. If you've got somebody, if you're in leadership and there's somebody under you who's causing problems, I'm not talking about messing up. I'm talking about deciding that they're going to be destructive, and they're just they're just out to out to draw blood. They're 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 go, they're gossiping. They're causing big problems in the church and causing divisions. If you don't deal with them, it's going to cause other people to be drawn into that sin. See what yeah. I mean? Uh -huh. And so your mercy is towards that person is unjust for those people who are who are getting getting cursed because of it. So So how do you balance a mercy with justice? It's the two point perspective. See, God is merciful, but he's also a just God. And we think of those two things as kind of opposing each other. But if you look at this street, at, at this drawing of the street, that's kind of how God's mercy and justice is. We see this road going off this way, and we think, okay, that's God's mercy. But then we see this road over here, and we see justice. Well, the God of the Old Testament, that was the law of God, and he was mean and everything. But now we serve this, this God who's a God of love. He's the New Testament God. When the truth is, it's the same God. And really, you're looking at two perspectives of the same thing. Consider this, okay? If God really loves you, won't he protect you? Right? Mm -hmm. But in order to protect you, won't he have to protect you against something wrong? Right. Mm -hmm. Which means there has to be some form of justice, right? Mm -hmm. And in order for God to be just, he has to take action, right? Mm -hmm. How can God claim to be good if he doesn't do anything about evil? Yeah. See what I mean? Because we know God has the power to do good, right? Mm -hmm. So, with that idea, there's that. So, God is merciful and just. Yeah. He is just in the sense that sin is, sin is wicked and God hates sin. And so when people live in sin, they build up wrath. Think of it as a, what is it, what is it that, that we joked about? An IRA wrath account? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, you're building up wrath with God against you. Yeah. See what I mean? Um, but then, when you repent, see what I mean? All of a sudden, you're on this other kind of slant here, where God's showing you mercy. Undeserved mercy, but mercy nonetheless. See what I mean? That kind of makes sense? Mm -hmm. So God is merciful and just. But remember, right, uh, St. Peter says that God does not desire that anyone should perish. He desires for everyone to be saved. Saying of Peter, I think chapter uh, four, uh, verse um, nine or ten, somewhere in there. Um, so God is merciful, but He is also just. Um, there is a day coming when God will uh, bring judgment on the world for all the all the sin. That, that's something that, that will eventually come. However, we don't need to be telling people with such you know, ha ha ha, you're burning in hell. You know what I mean? Like that that's unhelpful. First off, you catch more flies. With, with, where does it go? With honey than vinegar? Yeah. yeah. You catch more flies with honey than vinegar. In other words, I've seen more people saved by not mentioning hell than mentioning the fact that they're going to go to hell. Right. Mm -hmm. Just just throwing that out. Right. In fact, Grace and I were talking about um, how missionaries do their evangelism in China. They can't even mention Jesus, mm -hmm. and they still get to witness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That means the sole way to get the Chinese people 
to ask you how your life is different and to be able to give them a Bible is based on your life being different than their life. Mm-hmm. Jeez, talk about pressure. <laughs> see, but, but see what I mean? They don't have to bring up hell. They don't have to scare yeah. people into salvation. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, anyways, um, we must not be all justice or all mercy. Understand what I'm saying here. If we have the mentality of all justice, that means anytime anybody does anything wrong, we instantly want them to get what's coming to them. Right. That's being all justice. But at the same time, we can't be all mercy either. Because that means we're not taking care of business. You know what I mean? Let's say you have a kid. Don't touch that stove. Then they touch the stove. Oh, well. So then they go to touch you and don't touch it. Then they touch Oh, well. So you mean that there's no... There's only mercy. There's no yeah. rules. Right. See what I mean? There's no... That's not very just. See what I mean? Uh, and I use the example of a kid because I think it works great with, with this. But uh, So for us, we shouldn't act with all justice or all mercy. We need to do what's right, but be ready to forgive people and to draw them back in. Uh-huh. Does that make sense? Any comments or questions? Well, with the whole um, Ted Bundy thing again, I think as far as like, okay, if I was the... If I was if it was my daughter or sister or whatever that was a victim of Ted Bundy, I think that, like we were talking about, you have to forgive him in your heart. And you have to, yeah, you have to pray for, for, for God's justice. You know, God, you do what's fit. And obviously, God's justice in the situation was that Ted Bundy received the death penalty. But we should never be glad about that, and we should be grieved at the thought of Ted Bundy potentially going to hell. Because right. no matter what Ted Bundy did, God still loved him, and it still grieved God right. to you know, see Ted Bundy go to hell if that's where he went. Right. So I think that kind of goes with what you were saying about balancing justice with mercy is saying, okay, justice was served, and that's a good thing, and knowing that that was God appointed because obviously it happened, but not being happy in our hearts <coughs> that he's burning in hell. You know, like you hear so much about people saying, well, I hope, I hope they burn in hell for that. We should never hope somebody burns oh, right. in hell. But let's also remember, um, I think you're right, but let's also remember um, that not everything that happens is God appointed. But we talked about that before, remember? Uh, like, God didn't appoint for Adam and Eve to Right, But right. that doesn't negate what you said. Right. Um, if, 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 if Ted Bundy, you know, he received the death penalty, and it was allowed to happen, and God allowed that to happen, and that was God's way right. of bringing about justice, I don't think it's wrong for us to be okay with that. Yes, that's, you know, or even to think, okay, that's a, probably a good thing and for the, be- for the best. Yeah. But we should not be happy about right. anybody going to hell or being punished. So let's just do a recap from one of the, some of the stuff that we talked about before. If Ted Bundy sought forgiveness from God right before they pulled the switch, flipped the switch, would God have forgiven him? Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, if uh, Ted Bundy um, repented um, even months before, would he deserve to not, um, should they not have killed him? No, because he killed multiple women, and that needs to be reconciled. And it goes with what I said earlier about we make mistakes when we are living in sin, and we are oftentimes expected to live out the entire consequences even after we're saved. Right. Now remember, um, there's a lot of times when, when we seek forgiveness, and God just, I mean, it's over. You know, I mean, think of all the guys who are on pornography and stuff, and they repent, and they're able to get out of that. See what I mean? And there's really no long-term effect in the way of they have to go to prison or something. Uh, not that it's not wrong, but they don't have to go to prison or anything. But then Ted Bundy, you know, murdering someone. You know what I mean? There, there's some things that you can't... I understand what I'm saying here, guys. You can't let go because right and wrong is still right and wrong. I knew some people who were in leadership in a church and they did what was wrong and they caused a church split and they were pulled out of leadership and they were never allowed back in leadership and that was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Because some things are not just a simple 
and you're done. Right. So, I mean, some things mm -hmm. are, are more than that. Yeah. You know, think of uh, sexual predators who, here, here's, here's a good example. A 19-year-old or whatever has sex with a 17-year-old and then for the rest of their life is branded with this. Now, I'm not going to say whether that's right or wrong. I don't, I don't care one or another. My point being, society says that that's wrong. Right. And so for the rest of their life, they're going to be marked as a child molester. And that's something they're going to have to live with. And that's kind of a good example of what I'm talking about here, where some things are just, they're going to stick with you. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, anyways, remember that two-point perspective. God is merciful, but he's also just. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did that not show on the screen? Oh, you went backwards. Oh, okay. Okay. So that takes us to, I'm going to use the exact same image since I already got it in your head to, to bring up another idea. Discipline in the life of a Christian. And this is, once more, a two-point thing, okay? The first way would be self-discipline, and the second way would be congregational or church discipline, okay? Mm -hmm. And we kind of think of these <coughs> as, as two different things, but they're right hand in hand. Because when we are um, dis when we discipline ourselves, like through the process of fasting, giving up things of the world, why do we do that? Who do we do it for? Uh, for God, because our purpose is to glorify God. Yes, see what I mean. So, but then when a church uh, brings discipline on somebody, why do they do it for? Uh, for God, because their purpose is to glorify God. See what I mean? It's the exact same process. The only difference is some things are you deal with yourself, and then some other things, when they are not dealt with, have to be dealt with in order for the health of the church as a whole. Yeah. Okay? So we're going to look more at that kind of... Uh, this is an area that causes a lot of confusion with Christians, especially when, we, when, when they read like Matthew 7, uh, 1, where it says, uh, Do not judge. Okay? So... Uh, when should church leaders bring discipline to someone in error? This was last week's question of the week. Do you guys remember this? Um, what do you guys think? Is this like when someone's preaching to somebody? And no, 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 no. Not, not, not on like a, not on like during a service. But I mean, like um, when a church leader will go to someone and one on one and work with them about a problem that's going. On. Like, uh, like private. Yes. Yes. Private. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. When should that happen? Well, definitely when they're harming someone else, obviously. If, okay. if, they're, if they're doing something harmful. You, you're talking about physically or spiritually? Or both? Both. Okay. Um, a lot of, obviously, physical things <coughs> can be spiritually harm, harmful as well, you know. Um, obviously, if we, I'll bring it up because you had mentioned it. If somebody is molesting a child... That obviously has got to be dealt with immediately. Right. Right. Anything like that. Right. Um, I think even somebody who's really gossiping and stirring a problem, that needs to be addressed. Yeah. Because that causes so much dissension and... Yeah, it does. And, uh, yeah. you know, just can tear a church apart when you start pitting people against each other, yeah. you know? And that causes spiritual, you know, people to start, yeah. you know, it affects them spiritually as well. Did anybody else have any, any ideas? I think it also depends um, on the, um, if it's like a lesser thing, you know, um, obviously if, if they found out someone was, you know, hurting someone uh, physically, they should do it immediately. Um, but, uh, you know, of course, like, you know, go to the police and stuff, not only just talk to the person, but report it. But, um, like, you know, gossiping and um, different things like that. I think it. I think it also depends if it's like a repeat offender type person. You know, mm -hmm. if say, um, pastor sees um, Serena gossip about a person. Well, Serena's not known the gossip, so if it's just one time. Well, obviously he's not going to go up to her and um, say Serena never do this again. You know, um, he's going to look to see how things are going. And if it keeps happening and it becomes a problem, okay. then deal with it. Okay. So are you saying uh, church leaders should not do preemptive strikes, like squash something as soon as it takes root? Um, I dep it 
I think it depends on what it is. Okay. Um, the, to the degree of how how much it hurts people and how many of people it affects. Okay. Mm-hmm. I grew up in the church, and I was told how how drinking and smoking were the worst thing in the world, and how if you called yourself a Christian, you had no right to do these two things. Now, I don't smoke or drink, but let me tell you some stories. I there was one person I knew who stopped smoking, but they gossiped repeatedly. They they couldn't stop. They couldn't keep their mouth shut for the day of their life. Then I knew this other person who could never stop smoking. He just loved the things too much. Uh, but he was the, one of the most faithful people in the church and very helpful. Then I know some other people who never had a problem with smoking or drinking, but gossiped and complained all the time. Grew up in the church. Yeah. Their grandparents went to church. And they gossip and complain the whole time. See what I mean? So, I mean, but just, just some thoughts. What, what do you guys think about this? I, good so far, but I want to keep building on this. Well, I think drinking and smoking, you know, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think that's really anybody's place to confront anybody, like I said, unless it becomes harmful in the church, which I don't see how smoking can become harmful in church. You know, like, I smoked. The only reason I quit is because God specifically told me to quit smoking. I may still be smoking if God didn't tell me. I I really don't know. But that was my own personal thing. Like you said, I know people that smoke that still go to church and they love God and it doesn't change. Drinking is another, you know, issue because you can come to church, fall down drunk, you can become a distraction, that can become a bad situation. Well, not just that. I want to kind of I take a moment here. If you know if you know somebody who who is an alcoholic who needs help, I want to encourage you um, to help them get the help that they need. Mm-hmm. Um, we have an AA group over here at, at the church. Willie leads it. I highly encourage you to do that. Um, I don't really think that this is what Serena was talking about. I just want to throw this in here just in case there's anybody. Um, alcohol. Um, destroys lives and it really causes you to be the worst version of yourself you possibly can um, without um, drug related things like meth and whatnot. Um, it causes you to be violent towards others and um, it, ca- it will cause you you spiritually to die and the Bible does say specifically not to get drunk. Okay, So as far as if you're looking for a spiritual reason, God specifically says do not get drunk. It doesn't say don't drink, it says don't get drunk. And if you're looking for physical reasons, because the people you, you, lo- you who know you and love you uh, don't want to see you throw your life away. So just keep that in mind. Go ahead and say what you're saying. No, I mean, actually, that that's really great that you brought that up. I was going to kind of segue into that because it becomes destructive. And I wasn't just talking about people in church. It becomes It's destructive to that person. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's not just the pastor's job it's all of our job to lift people up and to yeah. see people get the help and the support that they need yeah. so if you know somebody is struggling with alcohol and drugs they do need to be confronted in love knowing that you're there to help them that you're yeah. not trying to just correct them but yeah. you're trying to help them because they need help so this probably should come from a friend and not, not, not a church leader though right is that um, what you're saying well, oh, were you going to... Oh, I'm sorry. Dissenting agree? Dissenting yeah, go opinion? Go ahead, Gracie. I, I, I think it could come from both. Okay. I mean, like, if, say, an elder or a pastor sees it, I mean, like, they're going to go to that person concerned. They're not going to go to that person with condemning hearts, you know? Well, I guess that depends on the pastor. <laughs> right. I've met a lot of pastors who go to them and tell them how they're going to hell. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> what, an ideal pastor would do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, the friend would do the same thing, you know. I mean, obviously it might it might come better off from a friend, but... Well, it might be good if the, if the friend and the pastor kind of come together and confront the person yeah. together. You might want to make sure it doesn't seem like they're gaining up on them, though. Do you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Isaiah, what were you going to say, bud? Uh, I was just... Uh, I said something to do with drugs. Uh, remember this one time... And uh, I had been walking between these two strangers. They needed something to drink, so I went and bought them something. And uh, this guy, he was being tortured in his mind because he how much he was drinking. And I could see that because I'd been there. And I had you pray for him. 
Remember that moment? Huh? Oh, right here. It was like this, yeah, this guy right behind yeah. there. Yeah. I just thought I'd bring that up. something to eat, I'll, I accept them. Yeah. It's, like, it's like looking at my own self. So I'll, what I do is I have an extra couple of bucks or something for the old mold for, for the night, I'll go buy them some. Yeah. You know, like, for what you like you guys do for the, you know, people that need food, you know, I think that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Isaiah said something there about uh, looking to his self. You know, it's easiest to bring discipline as people brought discipline to us. Because people, in general, are reactors. Hurt people go on to hurt other people. See what I mean? Um, if we are abused as a child, we tend to... Um, bring that same atmosphere into our home, regardless of whether we actually beat our child or not. There's just a, that that conflicted, unless something changes in our life. But on its natural course, you know, we do that, and then we can just kind of repeat it. And then um, our kids grow up and do the same thing. It's just kind of, you see what I mean? It's, it's kind of a, a repeating thing. Um, and one thing that's important to do is with discipline, especially with church. You do it looking to yourself. That means rather than um, doing it mirroring how people did it to you in the past, you do it putting yourself in their shoes. Like Isaiah just said. You see what I mean? Where, okay, what if this was me? You see what I mean? Because what we do as Christians as we grow, we reach a point where we think, boy, I am really some hot snot. I have all the answers, and I just, I really have it all together. So I can give all the answers to everything, and everybody looks up to me. See what I mean? And we get this this idea going on, like, here we are up here, and here's the rest of the peons down here. Yeah. See what I mean? And so then we start bre- bringing discipline to people as, as we get leadership positions and whatnot, where, like, oh, well, you're doing this, and I think it's wrong, and you need to stop, or else, you know, something, something we put ourselves in God's place, you know what I mean? Or else God's going to, going to you know, uh, send, do do this or that or the other thing. And, you know, sometimes God will give us a prophetic word to give to somebody, but sometimes we're just talking out of our own irritation or anger. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, yeah. But anyways, I'm getting off talk. Grace, can you turn on that light there? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you have to click it twice. Thanks. <clears throat> so let's kind of look at this idea of when should church leaders uh, bring this one. Um, unless somebody else had something to say before I move on. Did I cut anybody off? Um, the first thing to recognize is the church is a group of disciples who are all seeking God. Remember, the church is not a building. The church is our, the church are the people. The church is us. We are the church. Everything we do is a church event. It's a church outing. Okay? So the church is a group of disciples, which just means people who are seeking God, right? So a group of disciples who are all seeking God, but not perfect. Just because you are saved, it does not mean that you are going to stop sinning. It means that Christ's righteousness atones for your lack of righteousness. And the, the Bible says that if we if we confess our sins, then He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Okay. So every time you sin, does not mean you lose your salvation. <coughs> you lose your salvation. Oh, I'm sorry, bless you. Uh. You lose your salvation when you give it away. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. There's a song that I heard on the radio that ticked me off something fierce. It said, "Nothing can separate, even if I ran away." But that's not. <coughs> that's, that's actually what could separate us from salvation if yeah. we ran away. <laughs> Nothing separates us from God's love, but if we run away from God, we we say, "You know what, God? I'm not going to live your ways. I'm not going to follow you." That is giving away your salvation, and that is how you give up your salvation. See what I mean? So, 
The church is a group of disciples who are all seeking God, but not perfect. And how funny that Isaiah brought that up, because that's exactly what this verse here is going to say. Uh, it says here in chapter 6, verse 1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Exactly what he just said. And I could really get into this, but I think um, we might talk about Galatians later, so I think I'm going to hold off uh, the majority of the discussion on this. Um, but the focus there is definitely on, on restoration. Restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watching yourself, lest you too be tempted. And I think there's a few things. First off, did you know that when a pastor preaches something, either he has gone through it or he's speaking out of arrogance and will go through it very quickly? Did you know that when you um, condemn someone or pray against someone or um, whatever, God will send a time of testing to test your heart as well? See what I mean? Because God doesn't like that arrogance in us. <laughs> God doesn't like arrogance. Even if you're a Christian, God still doesn't like arrogance. Yeah. So, um, okay. So just some things that Christians are expected to do. First off, people completely miss, the, miss what Matthew 7 is saying because they just read the one verse. I can find the what? verse. Just read one verse. Right? What? And I have a time with this. Um, and I've taught on this chapter multiple times, but bear with me. Judge not that you not be not judged. So they just stop there. Okay, don't judge anybody for anything. But that's not what the Bible says. Because in John, Jesus says, judge correctly. So how could he say do not judge and judge correctly? See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because people just grab a verse that they like and they leave it there. Yeah. But that's not the whole story. If you keep reading, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. What he's talking about here is being a critical person. Don't criticize people. See what I mean? The, we get in this attitude of spiritual superiority where we think we're just hot snot. And we have all the answers, and we want to we just criticize every, everybody, every, everything. Uh, Serena, you're not growing in the Lord because of this. Gracie, you're not growing in the Lord because you're doing this. Nicole, you're not growing in the Lord because of... See what I mean? It's not... It, people think this. God has given me an enlightened spirit that I'm able to see all of your faults. But God doesn't do that. He doesn't help us to see faults in everybody else. He helps us to submit our lives to God so that we would be a witness to others. See the difference? We, we tend to be egomaniacs all about us. So obviously we're only going to see the things that we like. So when you're correcting someone, when there's discipline being given, do it with humility. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Mm -hmm. And this is the exact same thing when we're disciplining kids, too. I bring up kids a lot because I've got a kid, you've got a kid, you've got two kids, you've got, you've got a kid. <laughs> and, uh, I'm a step you dad. and you're a stepdad, so you, you kind of do, too. And you're an uncle, so you kind of feel it anyways. Um, sometimes we'll do something like this, right? In our lives, we will show our kids not to be submitted to God, right? I'm going to spend my money however I want, whenever I want, and uh, on whatever thing I think that I want at that time, without asking God or anything. I'm not going to consult God's word. I'm just going to spend my money, money however I want. And then your child grows up to be... Now, obviously, people have within us selfishness anyways. Okay, It doesn't take that much to make somebody selfish because they're already born selfish. Right? But... Then they see us acting like this, and so our kids react by either hoarding their stuff or by stealing or so on and so forth. See what I mean? Because they've seen that same thing in us. And so then when they do it, you stole, and we get them in all kinds of trouble instead of seeing, ah, there's something here that my child is reacting to. Because the thing that you see the most in other people is usually in yourself. And I'll go a step further. The biggest flaws in your kids are amplifications of your character flaws. Yeah. yeah. Mike is real stubborn. I wonder where he got that from. <laughs> Gracie. 
See what I mean? <laughs> our, the character flaws that we see in our kids are amplifications of our character flaws. Where we think, oh, it's just a little problem in me. But then it hits our kids, and it's a big problem. You know what I mean? You guys know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So, anyways. Um, so, correct with humility, but don't be a critical person. There's a difference there. Uh, be discerning with who and when you give instruction. Uh, mm-hmm. Chapter 7, verse 6 says this. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. What does Proverbs say will happen if you correct a fool? He'll hate you. Proverbs says that if you correct a fool, they will hate you. That's exactly what Jesus just said here in Matthew. Be careful who you give correction to and when you do because some people just won't hear it. (coughs) And some people will currently not be in a place of hearing it. Let's say, for instance... Okay, Serena, I'm going to use you as my example, okay? Okay. Let's say Serena gets head over heels in debt. She's got her credit, five credit cards. They're all maxed out. She's got um, her car payment that she's laid for. She's got a house mortgage she's laid for. She's just head over heels in debt, okay? And then I could say something like this. Serena, this is how you need to handle your finances. Do you think that's the right time? She probably won't listen, will she? I'll probably make her my enemy, won't she? More <laughs> Not because she's a fool, but when we do things like that, we give ourselves over to foolishness, yeah. and that causes us to be hard of hearing. Was what I was, was saying, is it good and right? Yes. Is it what I should say at that time? Oh. No. Why? Because you don't give dogs what is holy. See what I mean? Yeah. Wait for the opportune time to tell us something. This, once again, I'm going to bring up kids. Your kid, Eli is a perfect example. He's 11 years old. This is uh, right about the right time. Your kid will do something stupid, and it's very easy to just jump on and instantly say something to shove down his throat. Or you could wait till an opportune time when he's ready to ask a question about it, and then you could give him the wisdom. Mm-hmm. See what I mean? Rather than cramming your wisdom down his throat where he won't listen to you, wait for the opportune time when he's ready, and then give him the wisdom. See what I mean? Because people, at, we all do this, are selfish. And we're not going to listen to other people because we want to do what we want to do. But if you wait till the opportune time, you can save somebody from a lot of a lot of pain in their life. See what I mean? So, um, and that goes for church discipline too. That's what we're talking about. Church discipline, the opportune time. Not saying things don't need to be taken care of, and there's some things that do need to be taken care of right now, like abuse, for instance. Mm-hmm. Serena brought that up. But there's a lot of other things that need to be taken care of, just not right now. Yeah. Wait for the opportune time. Okay, so. Uh, treat others as they want to be um, I wrote that down wrong treat others as you want them to hold on treat others others as you want to be treated not as you actually are treated does that make sense Mm -hmm. see what we what do we do when we get hurt well we hurt other people but that's not what Jesus says listen to this so whatever you wish that others would do to you do that to them for this is the law and the prophets in other words somebody has wronged you but rather than, you know, oh, well, I just wish that, you know, God would rain down fire and swallow them up. Well, what do you wish that they would do to you? I wish they'd forgive me. I wish that they'd be patient with me. Well, then how about you do that for them? See what I mean? And that's the law and the prophets. That summarizes all of them. But then lastly here, uh, 7.15, uh, genu- genuinely seek God. Excuse me. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. But I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter, I think. <coughs> well, I'm just going to pretend like this was the right verse, and we'll just plow ahead. Uh, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Is that idea of not looking the part, but actually seeking after God. Were you going to say something? Oh, okay. Uh, so there's that idea of genuinely seeking God. So before we even start with church discipline, we start with ourselves. We are not perfect. We're just seeking after God. We are expected to not be critical of other people. We're, just, we're expected to give wisdom at the right times. We're expected to treat others uh, the way that uh, we want to be treated. And we're expected to seek after God. I'll give you a good example of this. There was a, there was a teenager that came into church. I'm not going to say where or who it was or anything like that. Uh, I doubt any of you would know her, but just in case. And she wore a dress to church. 
and um, there was this older person who, who instantly hopped on her and said, you're supposed to wear a slip with that kind of a dress. This person was not somebody who wears dresses. They went out of their way to try and look nice for church. I mean, and they were, they were kind of a rough person, you know what I mean? But they were taking a step trying to do what was right. And so, did she have to say that? Well, no. Or if she did have to say it, she could have said it with a better attitude. But she hopped down this girl's throat, and I felt so bad. I mean, there was nothing I could have said at that point. Uh, and there was no way to fix it. The damage had been done. So, once again, uh, that's on the personal level. But that takes us to the actual congregational idea. <coughs> what are the three stages of bringing discipline to somebody in a church setting? As recorded in Matthew 18, 15 through 20. Well... For a, for a leader, I think. The first one is that they should go to the person privately. The next one is they should, if they don't repent, they should take someone, one or two people with them. And if they still don't repent, they should excommunicate them. Okay. So, that takes us to Matthew 18. One on one, three to one congregation. Okay. Um, so how this would it's there's no exact equivalent here because we're talking about the Jewish court versus the Christian church, so that's the separation of two thousand years. How this would separate to today is what do what do people do traditionally when they have a tiff with somebody? They go to the pastor, right? Mm. Yeah. That's not what you're actually called to do. When you have a tip with somebody, you are supposed to go to that person and try to resolve the issue. See what I mean? So, let's look at a few things here. Matthew eighteen fifteen. It says here, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Now, notice a few things. It doesn't say if your brother um, does a minor thing that you don't agree with. I mean, they actually sin against you. Okay? I'll give you an example. I run into Serena's car with my car and then just leave. I have sinned against her, right? We're not talking about I got a tattoo and Serena doesn't like that. Okay? Because right. people always try to do this. They, Serena, you got a tattoo and I don't like it. So I'm going to go and tell you, you're wrong. And then you have to say, you have to say yes, I was wrong and I will never do it again. And then if she doesn't, then I'm going to go tell the pastor. That's not what, what Jesus is talking about at all. He's saying if someone legitimately sins against you, right. not doesn't do something you like, sins against you, you go to that person and confront them their fault. Okay, so Serena would come to me and say, look, I saw you hit my car. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that you should either pay for the repairs or report it to your insurance. Mm -hmm. And then I should say, okay, Serena, let me go call my insurance company. What I should not do is tough. <laughs> then Serena would go get one or two other people, probably someone um, who she saw as my authority, like my pastor, my dad, since he's also the pastor, and probably like crazy. See you know what I mean? And then go to me and say, "Look, you did this. I saw you do this." See you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now I'm using the example of running into a car, but this is more. Um, serious than that. He's more talking about things that, that, that separate people. Right. Like, that's more of a legal thing. Uh, Jesus is more talking about things uh, on more of a moral scale. Right. <coughs> um, between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So this would be a good example of that, not in a legal setting, in a more of a moral setting, okay? I, here's a good example. Okay, here's a good example. I turn gay with Serena's husband, who's actually my brother, so it's actually... Two counts of gross and stuff. And we have our little thing, right? Okay. So then Serena was wronged, right? So then Serena's going to come up to me and she's going to say, hey, this was wrong for you to do. See what I mean? And then I say, no, Sam and I are madly in love. <laughs> 
So then she's going to take other people to, to approach me of my sin. And then, see what I mean? And then what's going to happen? Well, then we're going to be excommunicated from, excommunicated from the church. Well, what do we mean by that? First off, in the modern setting, you're no, you're kicked out of membership. You're not allowed to vote on stuff. You're not allowed to do any of that kind of stuff. But second off, you're not, um, you're removed of any leadership positions. Like for instance, I'm the worship leader, so I would be taken out of that, and somebody else would have to do worship. See what I mean? And that also means, as John tells us as well, that people in the church probably shouldn't. You understand what I'm saying? Be associating with me while I'm living so boldly in sin. Okay. Now, what I mean by that is when somebody, and when a Christian gives themselves over to sin and decides to live that way, they cause harm to other people who are around them. I'll give you an example. There was a woman who could not shut her mouth. I swear to God, she could not shut her mouth. She just always had to say something stupid about somebody. Chuck did this. Zach did this. Isaiah did this. I mean, just going off, shooting her mouth off every second she could. Well, she ended up getting removed from leadership. That didn't work, so she ended up leaving on her own. But what had happened was she polluted two other people who were actually on the on on the right side and were won over to her side because they started associ- uh, they started hanging out with her. See, she was a gossip and she couldn't keep her mouth shut, and they started associating with her and they became gossips, and they were led astray. See what I mean? Bad company corrupts good morals. Mm-hmm. See what I mean? And I'm not saying you shouldn't associate with people in the world. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying when there's a person in the church who's living boldly in sin, don't surround yourself with them. It's like the it's like Proverbs says when there's a person a hot a hot tempered person, don't don't hang around them because you will become a hot tempered person. If you have an anger problem, don't hang out with other people with anger problems. See what I mean? Hang out with people who calm you down. So, uh, but that's a good example because it's more of a moral issue. I'm not talking about legal, this isn't really talking about legal things, because obviously, as 1 Corinthians tells us, hopefully you shouldn't be suing your brother. <laughs> hopefully you guys should be dealing with whatever it is that, that caused the tiff rather than be suing each other. If you're curious about that, read 1 Corinthians, he talks about it. But anyways, so those are the three stages of discipline, and we'll stop with this side because I'm not going to keep you here until 9 o'clock. Um, that means next week we will not be talking about addiction. That means next week we'll be continuing our discussion of discipline. Okay? All right. And we'll pick up with discipline not two weeks from now because we'll be at the zoo and there's no lesson that night. So we'll pick up with addiction the first week of September. All right. Yes, September. Okay? Uh, so uh, when somebody sins against you, it's a, this is very important, not costing about them. Chuck brought this up. You're, I think Serena did too. I don't remember. People, this was brought up. <laughs> uh, the idea of just because somebody wrongs you doesn't give you the excuse to gossip about them. Especially if they refuse to repent when you confront them. See you know what I mean? That doesn't give you the right to gossip about them. Well, they're doing wrong, yes. But somebody else's wrong doesn't justify your stupidity. Mm. Just because somebody else is sinning doesn't mean that I can sin. I mean, well, I saw uh, I saw Isaiah still, so that's gonna that means that I can now go and lie and, and cheat myself and everything. Well, Isaiah stole from me, so I'm gonna go steal from somebody else to make up money that he stole from me. See, what I mean, so, somebody else's wrongdoing doesn't justify my wrongdoing. Isaiah didn't do that, okay? <laughs> um, not with hate. Whenever there's church discipline, it cannot be with an attitude of hate. If you are disciplining with an attitude of hate, you're doing it wrong. Okay. Um, not for every little thing. We're talking about actual offenses, actually sins against somebody. Okay. Um, it's not for every little thing. I mentioned this before. Yeah, let's say Zach does something I just don't like. That doesn't mean I need to go and confront him. We're talking about see what what Christians nowadays we have the mentality of of being, getting offend, upset about something. We're easily offended. And so we look for things that people uh, have, have, can do to upset us. See what I mean? And so every little thing becomes a huge thing. Whereas what Jesus is talking about is people united in fellowship. Brothers and sisters. See what I mean? We're not supposed to be people.
taking each other's teeth. Oh, I see just a little something you did wrong here. I'm doing. See, I mean, that's not that's not what we're supposed to be about. Chuck and I were talking about how in the '90s there were all those Christian bumper stickers that were just dark. <laughs> so like, dark. <laughs> hey, no, yeah, hell is a real place, and you're going there. Dang. Jeez, Jeez. all down. See what I mean? Like, it's not what Christianity is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about Christ, not about some dead religion and scaring people. It's supposed to be about Jesus Christ. See what I mean? So, um, first off, it's not if you overheard something. Well, I heard that Nicole did this. Okay, you should probably get your fingers out of somebody else's tip. This is what we like to do. Zach's my good friend, okay? He, we're, we're best buds. We hang out all the time. He comes to me and says, Nicole did this, and she was wrong. We had this happen at, at Oasis the other day. There was a kid who came in there, oh, this kid did this, uh, did this wrong thing to me, but then comes out, turns out that he had done something wrong to that other kid first. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting when you know the whole story. <laughs> but anyways, so Zach tells me what, what Nicole's done wrong. And so I'm going to take up Zach's side because he's my friend. Nicole, you terrible person. How could you? I don't even know the whole story. I wasn't even there in the first place. So then I'm going to go to the pastor and tell him how my friend was wronged. What? Okay, first off, Zach should have kept his mouth shut. He shouldn't have come talk to me. If he thought he was wronged, he should have went and talked to Nicole. Yeah. Okay. And then if Nicole said, you know what, that's ridiculous. He should have taken some other people. Because I'll tell you this. Most TIFFs would stop at this point if they were done in this way. Because what happens is we take offense at something and we go and talk to the person and we do it with a real bitter attitude. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, they don't listen to us because we're talking with the wrong attitude. If we would correct our attitude before we talk to them, they would be in a place of probably listening to us. You know, Nicole... You did this, and it, and it really, I don't like the way that it made me feel. Well, another thing is that goes back to what you said about um, taking some time to cool down. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. I almost choked on my tea. Yes. <laughs> that. <laughs> cool off. Chill out. Um, like on, uh, well, I was watching My Name is Earl, and uh, there's this guy that, there's this guy that <laughs> keeps shooting him with a, um, a, a tap gun. I forget what it's called. Anyways, staple gun. Staple gun, yes. Uh -huh. And uh, he's all like, as a general rule, when people start being violent, I give them time to cool off and come back later. <laughs> anyways, uh, what was I saying? Uh, sorry that my name is real thing, really. Uh, <laughs> you were talking about. Oh, yes, how it would die off. Yeah. And so then at this point, when we take somebody else with us, this is usually what happens. The other person will say, mm, maybe you were wrong See what I mean? Because they'll bring clarity to the situation. They hopefully, if you didn't gossip, right. they're fresh ears and they can hear both sides and they can say, mm, and it won't have to go to excommunication because it'll turn out something small. Like maybe Nicole didn't really wrong Zach. Maybe she cut him off because she didn't see him on the road. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Maybe it wasn't that big of a thing and it was just blown out of proportion. Right. Well, you'll never know if you don't communicate. Do you know what I mean? Uh -huh. Communication is key for marriages. It's key for church relationships. It's key for everything. Relation. I mean, communication, communication, communication. So, um, it's also not if their foot slips. We're going to look at this next week with First John chapter five. But just because somebody commits a single sin does not mean you instantly need to hop down their throat. That's called a sin not leading to death. Right. If you read First John chapter five, verse sixteen and seventeen. But then there's a sin that does lead to sin. I mean, it does lead to death. This is where the person is repeatedly turning their back on God. Is what? Yeah. Intentionally doing Intentionally it. doing it. Their conscience is bearing witness. People are telling them, this is wrong that you're doing this. And they keep doing it. Yeah. That is a sin leading to death because it causes them to lose their faith. It causes them to give up on God. It causes them to push God away. It causes them to lift up a wall of sin. So, I mean, that separates them from God. That is a sin leading to death. But just because somebody sins doesn't mean that that sin is leading to death. Right. See what I mean? Yeah. Like, let's say, I know where Serena's at now. She already brought this up, so I'll play on it. I know where Serena's at now. So if I saw her smoke one time, I'd be a little concerned and I would pray for her. But I probably wouldn't bring it up to her. But if I see her continually start, start smoking again, I'm going to bring it up to her because I know where she's at. And I know that she thinks God told her not to do that. 
So that means that she started again, there's something going on in here. She either got hurt or she's just exasperated in her faith. She needs some help. She needs some encouragement from a Christian brother or sister. See what I mean? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So, not just because somebody foot slips, somebody's foot slips doesn't mean you need to hop down their throat. Right. Okay. Uh, you see, in the past, the Christian Christians have been too harsh, and they've been all about doing the right things, all about legalism. Do it, if you look right, if you dress right, you're okay. You have to dress a certain way to go to church. You have to act a certain way in church. It's not about being real with God. It's not about seeking after God. It's about playing the part. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? And in, so in the past, the hundred years, it's been all about that. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to have to fight all the harder now to bring it back to a level of view of mercy and justice. Right. See what I mean? Because they went too far to the justice side, didn't they? It wasn't about mercy. It wasn't about love. It wasn't about God. It was about justice. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but then also, if you look at the surrounding passages of chapter 18, verse 15, does anybody know the story that's instantly before this one? Anybody? The parable of the lost sheep. Jesus says, if any of you lost a single sheep, wouldn't you go after it? And, and let me tell you something else. Heaven rejoices more over that one that's found than over the 99 that stayed. That should be your attitude when in church and discipline. That if you're able to save one person, one person is better than all the people in the church that never messed up once. And heaven rejoices more over that one person coming back than over all the people who stayed and didn't mess up. That should be our attitude in church discipline. Because, one, uh, because that puts our eyes on what God sees as important. That people are being renewed in relationship to Him. Not that things are being done our way or how we see fit, but that people are being restored in their relationship to God. That's important. See the difference? Mm -hmm. So then the story before that. I'm sorry, I lost my place here. The story before that. Temptations to sin. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by who it comes through. And then the, and then the story before that. Now check this out. Unless you turn and become like children, you will uh, never enter the kingdom of heaven. So first, he starts off the chapter about, how, about your attitude in seeking God. And then he goes to the next section in verse 7 about don't cause other Christians to sin. Don't cause other people to sin. And then he goes to the next one with restoring people. So if they do sin, pulling them back in. And then he goes to this thing of if your brother sins against you, how it needs to be dealt with. And then he, the next story is the parable of the unforgiving servant. Mm -hmm. What happens when you don't forgive that person who's wronged you? And restoration isn't made. See, in the perfect scenario, two Christians should, who are, who are, one is wronged the other, this should be the mindset. One should want to restore the other one, and the other one should want to be restored. That's the ideal. And if two Christians are genuinely seeking God's will, there in the midst of two or three is God. So mm -hmm. what I mean, and Jesus talks about this. I am with you in the midst of two or three when they're gathered together. Um, uh, so then, uh, yeah, and then after that, I just thought this was hilarious. He's talking about forgiveness and all this stuff. The very next part in chapter 19, divorce. <laughs> and he says about how divorce is because of hardness of heart. <laughs> I just thought that was funny. I, I, I know there's reasons for divorce and everything. I'm not getting into that, but I just thought that was so funny. He's all talking about lack of forgiveness, and he talks about divorce. It's like, oh, because <laughs> I'm married. I get that joke. <laughs> so, anyways. Um, and so the, the, so the last thing about this, and you're going to want to write this down. Do they know better, and are they saved? If somebody knows better and they're do wrong, that's different than if somebody does wrong but doesn't even know better. See what I mean? And it's a harsher judgment. See what I mean? But then also, or as I say to Melvin, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You, you know what I'm saying, right? You know what I'm saying? Uh, and are they saved? See what I mean? Because if someone is not saved, we don't have to bring church discipline on them. They're not saved. Church discipline is for the church. So what the church has done in the past is every time it sees a sinner sinning, they make a giant tiff about it. Right, they make a giant tiff about it and, and, and try to 
and try to get them to act better when what they should be doing is telling them about the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. See the difference? Yeah. I'm telling you, let me reword it in case you didn't catch it. You've been taught wrong all these years. Christians are not supposed to be judgmental. Hmm. I don't know how else to say it. So, do they know better and are they saved? Do they know better and are they saved? Let's say, for instance, I don't know. I can't think of anything else. Zach wrongs me, however you want to say it. He doesn't know that it's wrong. Well, be merciful to him. See what I mean? There's a difference if somebody absolutely does something in defiance, as Chuck said, versus if somebody accidentally does something. Right. So do they know better? Are you maybe overreacting? I know one time Eli did something and I hopped down and so he didn't even know it was a bad thing for him to do. I assumed he knew. But he, nobody had ever told him before. See what I mean? Maybe I should have been more patient. Uh-huh. Do you catch my drift? Uh-huh. Same thing applies for church discipline. Patience. And then also, are they saved? Because if somebody's not saved, they're not held to the same standards as if they are saved. Yeah. See, we, church discipline is for the sake of restoring somebody to relationship with God. But if they're not in relationship with God, there's nothing to restore. So, any questions? No? Okay. Next week we're going to be looking at um, people you shouldn't pray for. Okay? And I want you to read, this is your assignment for the week. Read Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 16. Jeremiah, it's the second major prophet. There's Isaiah, then Jeremiah. Okay? The chapter is chapter 7, and the verse is verse 16. One six or six zero. Wait, what? Oh, I see. One six. Sixteen. Sorry, I am with my throat. It's a miracle. Yeah, I need to talk to you. Sixteen. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 16. chapter seven. Seven. Yeah. Verse sixteen. Verse okay. Yeah. One six. Verse sixteen. Okay. Not sixty. Sixteen. <laughs>